Well, thank you very much, Harvey, and thank you for inviting me to come and talk to your group today. Um, I have actually visited, uh, ARP is not probably the most automated laboratory in the world, but probably in North America. I've been to a couple of the really highly automated laboratories in Tokyo. Um, it would be hard for you probably to grasp the enormity of what I'm about to say, but Tokyo alone has three very large reference labs, each of which receives 100,000 patient specimens a day and reports a million uh, reportable results a day. And so if you want to see some automation, <laughs> that's where to go. And I've been to two of those labs. Um, at any rate, um, uh, I thank Harvey for the very nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is what we want to talk about today. I was asked to talk about future laboratory automation. And uh, so I'm, I'm not going to show videos or, or, or photographs or slides about AREP's existing automation. Um, if you want to see that, our existing automation, there's a tremendous amount of information about it on our website, which is www.arupLAB.com. And then you, you have to do a little bit of searching under technical expertise and then automation and you'll find it. But there's a lot of videos that you can play of our automated transport and sorting system, our automated storage and retrieval system, uh, uh, the world's largest uh, clinical laboratory freezer, at least I think it is. I couldn't get the Japanese to tell me how big that one system is they have. Uh, but what we're going to talk about is uh, um, the, the, what I think is the future trends in laboratory automation, an overview of, uh, of what's going on recently in clinical lab automation with more vendors and more options, uh, faster conveyor systems, um, and then I want to really spend much of the time talking about how laboratory automation can impact patient safety through primarily machine vision systems, which are automated quality inspections, and I'll talk about some of these things that are listed here on this slide. So the learning objectives for this talk, since I was told to prepare some, are shown here on this slide. Uh, one is to identify and list three conditions that can contribute to the growth in cl clinical laboratory automation. Two, define the difference between task targeted automation and total laboratory automation, TTA and TLA. And then to list at least three types of inspections that may be performed by automated systems replacing human visual inspections. Um, so automation is here to stay. Um, probably many of you read CAP today and see uh, uh, the annual issue on automation that they do. Uh, the most recent issue, which was in September, if you simply count up what all the vendors claim are their automated systems that they've installed, there are more than 1,100 US labs with total or subtotal automation systems. And that's excluding an estimated 575 hematology systems. Uh, U.S. users of automation are generally satisfied with their automation choices. Uh, over the next several years, options for automated systems, I think, can reasonably expect it to increase along with the technical sophistication of these systems. And as we all know, the shortage of qualified medical technologists is only going to get worse. So automation and process re-engineering uh, are really the chief ways to address this shortage of laboratory personnel. So this was a survey that was done by the Washington G2 Reports Group uh, about five years ago. Um, and they surveyed people that had automation systems and um, generally uh, people were highly satisfied only three or four percent of the people's of the laboratory managers who were surveyed said that they were not satisfied with their automation decisions and uh, as you could see in the footnote towards the bottom um, uh, a fairly significant percentage said they expected to add automation just in the coming 12 months 
Well, um, this uh, survey was done at a point in time when there was an estimated 525 U.S. labs with automation and uh, about two-thirds of which would be total lab automation, about one-third task targeted automation. And as I showed in the previous slide, that number has more than doubled now over the last five plus years. So going back to that CAP article, um, worldwide, um, about 2,400 total laboratories have total lab automation systems. Um, in addition to the 100 plus US labs with task targeted automation, there's another 800 labs worldwide with task targeted automation. There's about 600 US labs with automated hematology systems and 2,300 worldwide. There are 13 total vendors listed in that CAP um, Today article that offer either total lab automation or task targeted automation systems or both. Uh, I'm not going to go through a review. Um, you don't need to hear from me about Beckman Coulter and Ortho and Abbott and all those guys. You all already know about all those vendors. What I want to do is to talk about the newer players in the field, ILAS, Lobotics, and Motoman under the TLA vendor line. And I want to talk about uh, two newer vendors in total in task targeted automation systems, um, which uh, are, would be Motoman and Sarstedt. So some of these newer total lab automation systems. This slide is a, a photograph of a uh, ILAS series. ILAS uh, is Integrated Laboratory Automation Solutions, Inc., based in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, uh, Bill Neely, a well-known pathologist at the Detroit Medical Center. This is his company that he founded based on the automation systems that he had developed in his uh, garage or his basement uh, over a period of many years. And uh, he turned it into a, uh, into a business. And... Uh, uh, his real forte is, is that he can put together a very inexpensive system that can serve a hospital lab. Now, it just happens that connected to that system, and I'm hoping the cursor shows up. There it is. So connected to that system is a Motoman Auto, Auto Sorter 3. Actually, there's two of them. This is one also. And uh, uh, the ILAS system has been installed at the MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center in uh, Texas and has uh, either one or two, I'm not sure, Motoman Auto Sorter 3s connected to it down there. Uh, this system can be connected to a number of uh, uh, analyzers which are listed down in here. It has point and space sampling uh, connections to uh, analyzers from a variety of vendors and uh, it's, it's an option worth looking at for people with a limited budget but who want to have full connectivity. Lobotics, uh, David Chul, maybe get a chuckle out of this. Our, this is our, the reincarnation of our buddy Rod Markin. Um, Lobotics was a Canadian company that was purchased by uh, Lab Interlink, which was Rod Markin's company formed at the University of Nebraska. Unfortunately, Lab Interlink went bankrupt about eight or nine years ago. And, uh, uh, and so just recently in this past year, uh, we've seen the reincarnation of uh, Lobotics Automation. And uh, this, is, this is a CAD drawing of a uh, Lobotics system. But they have the ability to integrate analyzers to their conveyor system, as well as a variety of modular uh, functional units such as centrifuges, uncapper, recapper, aliquotter, and so forth. And all of that, a lot of that is shown in this drawing. And then a third system that I would like to show you, uh, and this system is actually installed at the Kaiser Permanente Core Laboratory in Richmond, California was built by uh, a consortium of, headed up by Motoman, but also including a LOCA, 
the Japanese company. And there are six large Aloka aliquotters, which are this first row where I'm pointing with the cursor and then the row behind it. And uh, this is a huge pre-analytical system. It doesn't have analyzers connected to it, but it's primarily for uh, pre-analytical sorting and processing uh, and, um, and aliquotting. And uh, um, the, the front line that's over here in the, in the foreground to the right is uh, uh, where the hematology comes off to go to their Sysmex hematology systems. There's sorting that goes to the left uh, that, that then leads to, through these aliquotters, and leads to a variety of sorting for a variety of testing. One of these sorters that's back here uh, recaps the aliquots so they can transport them to their uh, affiliated reference lab over in Berkeley. So this has a variety of functions associated with it and uh, um, represents a, an initial foray of uh, Motoman, which has been primarily an industrial robotics company, into lab automation. Uh, here are some newer task-targeted automation systems. Uh, the Motoman Auto Sorter 3, uh, we have uh, two of these in our laboratory. There are, uh, uh, I already mentioned that there were, uh, was one or two of them down at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, there are a couple of them at Kaiser Permanente um, lab Hospital Laboratories in Southern California, and the Richmond Laboratory has a couple of them. And uh, uh, this is an automated system that can sort incoming specimens, uh, read the barcode, determine whether or not that specimen should be centrifuged. After centrifugation, put it through a decapper and then sort into analyzer specific racks. There are two uh, 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 different robots operating on the deck of this, both of, both of which are uh, Cartesian type robots, so they go in two dimensions. And, and so it's, it's very fast and it basically its throughput is the same speed of the centrifuge. So whatever you set the centrifuge, if you're gonna to try to do six runs per hour or five runs per hour of the centrifuge, the centrifuge buckets hold 24 tubes each. And so its, it's throughput is somewhere on the order of 550 specimens per hour. Um, the PVT uh, company in Germany has been for a number of years making a variety of, of uh, uh, aliquoting and sorting systems. And um, this is one of those systems, the, the, the RSA Pro Workstation. And uh, what is unique about this one is, and I, I think I will refer to this later in the talk, is that it has a, a uh, QS1 camera quality system which can actually look through the side of the tube as long as it's not completely covered with labels. And it can de measure and quantify, or at least semi-quantify, the amount of hemolysis, lipemia, and icterus that might be in that tube, as well as determining the volume of specimen in that tube. And uh, this is the Sarstad DCRC900 Flex. We have two of these in our laboratory today, a third one coming in in about another month. Uh, we love these. I have uh, <coughs> some photographs of the actual ones we have. Basically, this allows for input uh, in some sort of a customizable input tray or rack, uh, decapping and output into analyzer specific racks. And then a reverse operation, still with the same unit, where you can take those analyzer-specific racks, uh, put those on the input side, recap those tubes, and transfer those tubes into a su suitable output tray. So this one, which is used in our automated endocrinology section uh, for our 25-hydroxy vitamin Ds, these uh, yellow buckets are, are from large uh, floor model headage centrifuge, and here are capped tubes going in in the, in the centrifuge buckets. The turntable at the back is where the decapping is, and you can't really see that very clearly. And then these are uncapped 
tubes going into Diasaurin liaison racks along here. Uh, when uh, testing is complete, they put the liaison racks back here. And sorry, I took this photograph just as the last tubes were going through. And these are capped tubes on the output into carriers for our automated track system that have been recapped with push caps, as noted up here. Um, this next slide uh, is the other one that's over and serving our immunology core laboratory. And so these are some, just some input trays that the immunology core laboratory wanted to use and the tubes are being decapped around the turntable in the back here and then the output is going into quantum metrics racks they also are outputting into uh, uh, fadia immunocap racks uh, I, I didn't mention that the other one that's over in the automated endocrinology also has a drawer can be fit with a, a different drawer so it can do Abbott Architect racks, and all of these are customizable. You simply choose the racks that you want to use. And then here is, uh, here's the output quantum metrics racks coming back into the carriers for the track system to go back to storage. In this case, this particular model is applying not the push cap to, in recapping the tubes, but is applying a screw cap. So the same uh, uh, screw cap that we use on our SARSTET tube today is what's being put back onto that tube. So we really like these units. They're very, very flexible. They're very quickly to uh, set up and operate. Um, the other feature of uh, new clinical laboratory automation that I think is worth uh, noting and talking to you about are uh, in two areas. One is new track technologies. Both of these companies, FlexLink and Magnamotion, had exhibits at this past summer's AACC meeting in Anaheim, and I'm sure they'll be at the, the next AACC meetings coming up. Uh, compared to our track system that we operate at ARUP, which can transport 2,000 specimens per hour on any given uh, stretch of track. The FlexLink X45 conveyor uh, can transport 3,000 pucks per hour, so it's about 50% faster. Uh, and the pucks are automatically, or they, the system comes with the pucks having RFID chips in them, uh, which is a, it really makes it uh, very useful for identifying the pucks on the track and for routing the pucks to the correct uh, delivery address on the on the automation system. The other one is from a company called Magnamotion, which is a relatively new company started up by four uh, um, engineers from um, MIT, and it's called the Magnamover Light Transport System, and it's using linear synchronous motors and magnetic pucks. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with bullet trains and people movers and things like that that are using maglev technology where the the system employs repelling magnets so that the moving vehicle rides on a layer of air and there's no friction with the track this is sort of the opposite but similar in a sense so the pucks are magnetic the motors are hidden inside the track in a, in a one meter section of track, there are 60 small motor coils. And so the magnet is repetitively attracted down the track from one coil to the next. Uh, this is the system we've chosen for our track of the future that's that we're going to be having uh, custom built and with all new robotics and all sorts of stuff. So. Uh, this system is nine times faster than our present track. A given section of track could transport at full speed up to 18,000 pucks per hour. The other area where I want to spend most of the time today is in automated inspection systems, or what I call machine vision. And these include inspections for tube type and tube size and cap color, inspections for volume, both total volume and the volume of uh, serum or plasma above uh, a packed clot of red cells, 
uh, inspections for fibrin or hemolysis, lipemia, icterus, and so on, and inspections for mislabeled specimens. I think this is an area where clinical laboratories will make considerable progress over the next decade uh, and an area in which we can really address the shortage of trained medical technologists. This is the FlexLink track. And it's, it's really very slick to see this live. Um, these um, conveyors move very quick. These are some of the actual pucks. Um, and uh, they have all sorts of mergers and diverters, as you show here with just a little grabby thing. We can uh, play that one more time so you can see how they just um, will feed these things onto different lines or go around uh, mergers and diverters and that sort of thing. So it's a very, it's a very slick system. The Magnamotion one is uh, the one we've chosen for our future automation. Uh, for a new building that we're going to be building and this should be going live in about three years. And uh, as I said, these are magnetic pucks gliding around on stainless steel track. Uh, very, very fast, very smooth, and what you'll notice is no moving parts. When our bioengineers heard that their only maintenance was to dust it off once a month, they were kind of excited. So this is, uh, this is the Magnamotion system, and just a, 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 a couple of CAD drawings of what the system might look like in the laboratory, and I already showed you the video. So let me, uh, let me conclude this part of the talk with, with a slide that I borrowed from uh, a, a consulting company called Argent Global Services. Um, top, this is not a David Letterman list, but sort of like that. <laughs> uh, top 10 reasons why automation projects are not successful. Uh, too often laboratory managers just don't have a complete understanding of what their current environment is, the processes, the costs, customer expectations. And so that creates a false understanding of what they might expect out of an automation system. Um, laboratories sometimes lose flexibility in their operations when they put in automation because of fixed processes that are associated with that automation and because of the limited throughput that they get. Uh, managers may have an unrealistic expectation of the system in terms of the cost reductions or the throughput or the return in, on investment that they may achieve. Um, there may be unplanned or poorly developed workarounds that are required to interface the automation with the manual processes in the laboratory. Um, unclear expectations of system functionality overbuilt and unnecessarily complicated system designs, inadequate technical support, a credible and realistic impact analysis might not have ever been conducted. There can be hidden costs such as labor, supplies, or maintenance with, associated with the new automation. And the biggest mistake, I think, is the failure to optimize their current processes and do process improvement before doing the automation. This is something that I've always preached in all of my lectures, that if you automate a poor process, you still have a poor process. So I'm a strong believer in uh, several uh, um, processes that a laboratory should go through when they're implementing automation. And the most important of those is workflow mapping. And you can do workflow mapping with material flows such as specimens or process flows. You can do data flows. Uh, you can do uh, workload maps. But I think doing work <coughs> workflow mapping is extremely important to understanding your processes before you engage in designing an automation system. We did this extensively in 1996 before implementing our current automation, which went live in 1998. We've been doing it for the past year as we get ready for our new automation. And we have not even attempted to send out RFPs for vendors and designing systems and even choosing the track until we had done all of this mapping, which was done a little over a year ago. 
Here's an example of a workflow map in which uh, uh, the receiving department in this particular laboratory is receiving 8,500 specimens. Of those, a certain number go directly into hemogeology testing, that's 2,500. And, uh, and then another um, 1,600 are going to urine analysis, and then that leaves uh, 4,400 over at this point, and some of them go through centrifugation and some go around and are not centrifuged, and you can see after centrifugations, another 400 are going to coag. So you can draw a map like this, determine the number of specimens that are flowing through your operation, and this really can help you in planning uh, your workflows and planning what kind of automation you might need. Uh, another important step, I believe, is identifying possible solutions to meet needs. Um, using re-engineering of processes, as I said, using quality and turnaround time measures, uh, workflow and timing studies to find the bottlenecks. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that the process improvements in a laboratory have to involve automation. Um, and you can gain a lot from some small re-engineering projects com compared to uh, the implementation of an expensive automation project. And as I already said, automating a poor process still leaves one with a poor process. Um, these were things that we did when we re-engineered re our processes. Uh, we use uh, a number of continuous quality improvement tools uh, such as Lean and Six Sigma. Um, we standardized our processing procedures to a best practice. Uh, we have uh, uh, reduced or eliminated non-value added handling, handling and sorting. We primarily were interested in uh, eliminating running around to find shared specimens. All too often in a laboratory, a specimen has to be shared between two different testing sections. The section that gets, its, gets the specimen first gets their work done on time and everything's cleared off of their pending list. And it's the second laboratory section that's supposed to have that same specimen that's stuck with the job of running around the laboratory trying to figure out where, what happened to that specimen. Evaluating alternatives, potential progress measures. We use most of these. We don't do stat specimens, so we don't, have, um, we don't measure stat turnaround time in our laboratory because it's, we're a reference laboratory but we measure our turnaround time both at median and 95th percentile. We, fought, we, we constantly measure lost specimens, mislabeled specimens, and we look at uh, some productivity measurements that I've indicated here. So here's a, uh, a plot of turnaround time, and uh, uh, um, this is for all specimens at ARUP. The baseline is the time. Um, Along the left side, you can see 0% of the tests going up to 100% of the tests for whatever that total test number of tests are for the given calendar year. And so 50% would be like a median turnaround time. And so you can see that if you just follow the years over here and follow the colors, that each year the curves continue to move towards the left, meaning that the turnaround time is getting shorter. And you could see the same thing at the 90th percentile, or you could see it at the 95th percentile, and so on, that the curves move uh, progressively to the left, meaning faster turnaround time. This is a, a lost specimen chart, uh, that, and I've been tracking this for many, many years. Um, and this is a log scale, as you can see down the less left side. And I plot lost specimens per 100,000 total specimens received. And you can see that this has been a very steady improvement. This green dashed line along the bottom is the level for Six Sigma performance, which is 0.34 per 100,000 or 3.4 uh, per million. Um, the red line was five sigma performance. Now, um, our quality department at ARUP actually plots this 
uh, as um, per 100,000 build units because every build unit on a specimen is an opportunity to lose the specimen. And so actually uh, some of these points that you see down here um, actually are at six sigma levels um, when, you, when you do it on a build unit. However, our build unit system changed in about 1997. And so I wanted to go back and show the old numbers that I had been collecting. And, uh, and the only way to do that was to do this on a total specimen basis. But um, at any rate, there's a tremendous amount of improvement, as you can see, over that period of time. Now, this uh, is a chart that I got from Bonnie Messenger, uh, our quality manager, um, before doing this talk, because it's the same data um, from the previous slide, but plotted in a much different uh, manner. And it's also, um, um, it's, it's processed as a process sigma. So it's, it's, it's using this, the uh, Six Sigma statistical model that she follows. And what she's tried to do is to show that different uh, initiatives, different things that have happened in the laboratory operation have influenced the improvement of, the, of, the, of this data. And so here you can see a major automation system that we upgraded to in, at the end of 2003, beginning of 2004. Here's another process improvement, missing sample checklist change. And then just in the past year, we started to go to a pod system, which is a team system in specimen processing. And that has resulted, that, that point there is kind of reflective of, of this point over here. And uh, um, this is a, uh, a productivity chart that I have tracked over the years and our, um, since we've implemented automation, our productivity has more than doubled from the neighborhood of 4,000 build units per technical employee per quarter to more than 8,000 per quarter at the end of the last fiscal year and last June 30th. So let's talk now the remainder of our time about machine vision and what is machine vision, if I can begin with a, a definition of it for you. Machine, visions are, machine vision systems are automated systems for the rapid inspection of products or items that replaces human inspection. Um, these can be cameras, these can be lasers, x-rays, gamma radiation, infrared, visible light spectrometers, just a variety of technologies that are going to replace the human eye who's going to pick up a tube or pick up a specimen or pick up a bottle of ibuprofen or whatever. And, uh, and know that it's correct and has been packaged or handled properly. Most consumer pro products that you purchase today were manufactured by processes that use machine vision. So I've, here's, a, here's a brief list. This is by no means comp comprehensive. I'm not going to read all of the things that are on this list. But if you have a bottle of water that you bought from the store, um, it's got barcodes, it's got expiration dates, it's got lot numbers, there's all this type of stuff, and all of that kind of information can be captured in machine vision systems. The bottles of water are packaged into some kind of a package, and there are camera systems that assure that the packaging system is working correctly and the package looks nice and neat, because if you're the customer, you're not going to buy it if the package looks goofy. And so on and on and on and on, there's the list of stuff that machine vision systems are doing for us. Here's a few examples in this slide. Inspecting quality of cap closure, inspecting for overfill or under, underfill in a bottle. You can see here an underfilled bottle. Inspecting for a torn label. This label is torn right here. Inspecting the label quality, date and lot codes. Um, this is my favorite. So here's a little glass shard in this bottle of orange, jar of orange marmalade that was picked up by x-ray. And I'm sure glad that somebody, whoever this company is, is using that. Um, this is a video that I do want to play. And what you're going to see here, this is uh, from an Anheuser-Busch 
bottling plant in St. Louis, Missouri. The, it's, uh, uh, this is the, one of the world's largest breweries and their large eight-story bottling plant. When I started working in machine vision a few years ago, um, I was really trying to learn a lot about it in other industries uh, because it had never been tried and uh, machine vision systems had not been tried in clinical laboratory. And, uh, and I'm from St. Louis and so it was a natural for me uh, to uh, call up a local establishment for which I had high regard and, uh, and I was able to establish a relationship with the director of packaging, qual packaging quality and, uh, 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 and technical services. And um, I just said, is it possible that you have any file videos or whatever that you could share with me? Well, they didn't. To make a, to make a, a long story short, Anheuser-Busch brought a film crew into the canning plant and made videos for me for my lectures. And I thought it was a wonderful thing that they did this. And so you're going to you're going to see this video. Now, not not only that, I need to explain that the cans going by on this system are going by at the speed of a thousand cans per minute, faster than the human eye can see. And so, since the first videos didn't turn out very well, they brought in the strobe light system and used a strobe light so that you could really see these better. So. My first lecture, I think I did this to an AACC audience, and I said, gee, I hope you all go out and, and when you're having dinner tonight, have an Anheuser-Busch product to thank this company for their public service mindedness. <laughs> so anyway. Got a sh that's the so actual sound in the factory. But you're going to see these cans going by, and this guy has just pressed something on a computer, and an underfilled can is going to pop out into his hand. Now that speed of a thousand cans per minute is uh, they're able to do this with gamma ray detection systems that are precise to 0.05 uh, to 0.05 ounces. And as you know, a standard can of beer is 12 ounces. So if that can of beer is 11.95 ounces or left, it rejects it. Now, higher any, here's a clue. California does not allow uh, underfilled cans. So in California, that range has to be between 12.0 and 12.05. So if you want to buy your beer in California, you're always on average going a little bit more per can. Um, but anyway, I did ask the fellow what happens to the cans of beer that the system rejects, and he assured me that the quality department gets them all. Uh, <laughs> nobody gets to drink them. But, any, but anyway, I was learning a lot about the concept of machine vision, and this, real, this was really valuable to me, I, th I thought, to uh, uh, understand what we could do with machine vision. So um, in, in, this, in this system, this device right here is, uh, is actually this gamma ray detection system that the, that's going by and that detects it and instantly kicks kicks the can out that's underfilled. And we can talk about where mach machine vision systems are coming into the clinical laboratory. And one of those areas is, uh, uh, it can be seen in Beckman Coulter's automate system. This has been out for several years, this system. But it has, a, it has the capability over on the right side of the system to uh, um, pick up a tube, look through the side of the tube, actually th through the labels, the tube doesn't have to be unlabeled, and it can t tell the difference between packed red cells and the serum and estimate the serum volume. So it then knows how much volume is available for making aliquots. Um, this system from Motoman has a, uh, has a camera system over here in the, in the corner where I'm pointing the cursor, and it can look at the tube type uh, the size of the tube, the color of the cap, and, convert, and then compare that information to what its expectation is based on uh, using the barcode and querying the LIS so it knows it has the right tube for the test that's been ordered. This is Olympus, and, now, and as we all know, Olympus is now part of uh, Beckman-Coulter. 
but it's the same concept. Here is looking through the side of the labeled tube, and it's measuring the, the volume of serum above the uh, in the tube that's been centrifuged above the pack cells. And uh, I already mentioned the PVT workstation, and it can do the size and presence of the stopper for decapping and recapping. Uh, it can do sample type by tube size and cap, co uh, cap color. Uh, it can uh, com compare to that to information to what it's expecting from the LIS. Uh, liquid level detection, volume calculation, hemolysis, lipemia, and icterus at three semi-quantitative levels for each. This one, however, cannot go through the labels. It does require six and a half millimeters of unlabeled tube window to work. So this is from the, uh, this is from the PVT system, and it, over here it, it's uh, showing these indices and quality parameters on the specimen, and that's the, the photograph that it's taken of the tube as it's doing this. So I, I'm going to talk a little bit about some machine vision, and we're running out of time, so I'm going to skip uh, this collaborative project with our College of Engineering to uh, develop a system for measuring minimum and maximum volumes and just talk about the mislabeled specimen project that's been a research project of mine. Uh, mislabeled specimens are a serious problem in the United States. A CAP cube probe study that was published in 2008 uh, for 147 labs that were willing to participate in the cube probe study showed an average of, of more than 1,000, one mislabeled specimen per 1,000 specimens received in those laboratories. And a similar cube probe study just recently published this past fall, and I had, didn't update the, to the actual citation, but it was just, I think, September issue of the Archives of Pathology and Lab Medicine. Uh, the blood bank error rate is, was in excess of 1%. Um, these are horrendous numbers, which should scare all of us if any, we have any of our own specimens going through laboratories for testing. And um, um, so, um, at ARUP, our error rate is not that bad. It's about one in 10,000, but that's still very unacceptable to me and I think to anybody else. Um, and uh, even though our downstream inspection processes catch 96% of the errors, we think, that still leaves an error rate of about one in a quarter million in which a result goes out the door on the incorrect patient. And I think that's still unacceptably high. So about five years ago, I started working on developing a machine vision system that could use high-speed cameras and try to do optical character verification and identify if our employee had mislabeled the specimen. And uh, we're making some pretty tremendous progress. Now this video will play out of the PowerPoint. So this is, a, this is a, still a prototype system that's in research. Um, here you see specimens coming down our conveyor system. Here's one of the cameras. Here's one of the cameras here. The other two cameras are around behind these other two panels. And the robot picks the specimen up momentarily in front of the four cameras, and we take four photographs. And then the software assembles the four photographs into a single photograph. So basically, you've taken the outside circumference, the outside of the tube, and you've unwrapped it from a three-dimensional image to a two-dimensional image. So now this, this view is from the conveyor towards the thing, and now here's, here's a different view. There you can see two of the cameras. You can see a close-up of the robot. We're going to be replacing the robot later this year with something other than a vacuum lifter. It'll be more reliable. Here again now from the side, you can see how there's two of the cameras and you can see it's picking up a tube. Now watch this screen up here in the corner and you'll see every time that thing picks up a tube, this image changes and that each time that's the new photograph. That's how fast the system is. It's able to do this analysis in two to three seconds per specimen. 
Now I'm you can't see this for HIPAA reasons. <laughs> it's been intentionally sort of blurred by our uh, audio, our audiovisual guy, so that you couldn't see this. And uh, but now I'm going to show you some examples. So this is an ARUP label, a, a hypothetical patient uh, named ARUP test comma St. Mary's, and it just simply shows that what we've done is put this little black square on the label as an as an fiducial mark, uh, an index mark, so that the software can find the patient name on the label. And the combination, the combination of that black square and this barcode, and the system then knows, okay, this is the outline of the ARUP label. So um, it then is going to take this barcode, query our LIS, and find out the patient name associated with it. So here, here you see what that operator screen looks like. And uh, here's, a, here's the ARUP label across here where I'm point, pointing the cursor. Test patient comma space pathology. This green circle is surrounding the little black square. This green outlines the barcode. It queried the LIS. It takes that patient name that had a comma and a space and just converts it into continuous character string, and then it looks outside the zone of the label, because here it knows that's the top edge of the label, and it tries to find the matching character string, again dropping the punctuation and spacing, and see if it can find a matching character string. And this is an example of a pass. It says down here, inspection result, inspection pass. Um, here's, an, here's an example of a fail, because I intentionally uh, uh, typed on the ARU people and uh, ARUP label an S as the end of the middle name, uh, so test comma ARUP males, but we had a customer make these labels up for us so we could have a different fonts and all that sort of stuff. And so the customer had just typed mail, and so the system saw that as a fail, which was the correct way for it to see that. Uh, and so on. So this project is coming uh, very close and I think sometime in the next year we're going to be going into what I call a, um, a high volume phase of the research. That is to say we'll have a good robotic system and we, we'll be running thousands of these every day and accumulating the data on the performance of this system. But it's still very much an R&D project. However, when we build our new building put our new track system in, that Magna Motion system that I showed you, and um, our plan is to have a half a dozen of these camera systems installed on that, and every specimen going through AREP on the track system will be photographed and inspected with this label inspection system. Um, so that's our intent uh, before we go live with it, is to run at least a million images through and get the actual statistics on true passes, false passes, true fails, false fails, and so on. And um, um, we, we think that we're going to eliminate uh, that 4% of errors, or 4% of, of uh, that, that 1 per 250,000 of errors that are, we think are going out the door. So we want to minimize the number of tubes that fail. Uh, due to label, uh, label quality, font training in, this, in, the, in the OCV system, uh, people putting the, the, the AREP label too close to the customer label and blocking part of the patient name, a variety of reasons like that where the specimen's correctly labeled, but the system can't see that it's correctly labeled. And uh, so if we can minimize false fails, we'll minimize the manual work that's required. We absolutely have to be able to guarantee in this system that <coughs> any mislabeled tube will definitely be caught. And the, 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 the way the whole thing will work is once this is on the automation system, anything that the computer can't pass is going to go to a lane where a human will inspect it. So um, with the, the work we've done up to this point in time, we're at about an 80% percent 
well, we started out at about an 80% failure rate. We got that up to only a 30% fail rate. And then the most recent uh, work that we've done is at about a 20% failure rate. And there are still some of these things that we can work on to improve and um, get that even better. Uh, and if our objective is to get it up to about a get it down to about a 10% fail rate or a 90% uh, where the system is passing it so that only 10% of our daily workload of, say, 50,000 specimens a day requires human inspection. So in summary, uh, progress is being made to develop a machine vision system that uses optical character verification to rapidly inspect patient specimens for patient name labeling errors and this technology does appear feasible. It's not something that we can patent. The camera company has got uh, umpteen patents. And uh, just because, I mean, they've patented for every kind of item going down a conveyor belt in a factory or a bottling plant. And the fact that we're using it for specimen tubes does not represent a difference from the kinds of applications that they've proposed it for. And then finally, what is going to help us in the mislabeled specimen arena as well is that there is a CLSI standard that's going to be coming out uh, in April um, um, on label formats, specimen label formats, which is going to, uh, amazingly enough, have all of us have all of our labels look the same. And they'll all have the same fonts and font sizes and formats, patient name in the top left corner. Everybody's going to hold the tube the same way, stopper in your left hand, tube reads left to right, and so on and so forth. Amazing that we've never done that <laughs> in our industry. Uh, so that's what, that is coming this year. Uh, these are some impacts of automation at AREP because I've talked about some of our systems. A tremendous amount of growth, tremendous improvements in turnaround time, uh, reductions in lost specimens, productivity more than doubling. And, uh, and uh, so this is a final slide, a summary slide, which um, about the growth of Clinical laboratory automation, I think everybody knows the reasons why automation is growing, the shortage of medical technologists, the, the baby boomers have, are causing more lab tests to be done, and the automation is continually getting better. There are both task-targeted automation systems and total lab automation systems that are having tremendous value in the laboratories in which they're installed. And there's a variety of machine vision systems that are coming that are going to be very effective, I think. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. I, maybe I can answer some questions. <laughs>